Hello and welcome to Lee on the Lectionary and today we're looking at the lectionary readings for the week known as Proper 13 in Year A and those readings are Isaiah 55 verses 1 to 5, Romans 9 verses 1 to 5 and Matthew 14 verses 13 to 21. Each of our readings this week focuses on compassion for the lost and its provision in Christ. Isaiah 55 is a rousing marketplace call to respond to the free offer of life in the gospel. Ho, come, he says, and grabs the attention of the passerby. But more striking still is the deal that is on offer. Satisfaction for no cost. Eat and drink without money, without price. People spend their hard-earned cash on all sorts of things which will not satisfy them, whether at a spiritual or merely physical level. We're often left disappointed by the shoddiness of workmanship or inbuilt obsolescence of the items raved about by today's retailers. But Isaiah claims to offer something rich and delightful at less than a bargain basement price. Is it a literally unbelievable deal or an old trusty promise backed up by divine guarantee? The prophet claims the latter, an everlasting covenant, the one that has stood for hundreds of years in David and his dynasty and will endure the purging of the exile. Israel is glorified and nations shall run to it for blessing because of the work of the suffering servant, despite current appearances or despondency. Who will listen and carefully listen? And who will come? In Romans chapter 9, we barge in on an emotionally unpleasant truth. Many in Israel would not only reject Isaiah's offer, but they would reject the Messiah himself when he appeared. Moses offered himself as a penal substitute for Israel in Exodus chapter 32, when they rejected God in favour of a golden calf. Blot me out of your book, he suggested, but forgive their sin. And likewise, Paul feels so strongly and deeply for his people that he has great sorrow and unceasing anguish in his heart for them. If it were possible, he would be willing to be accursed and cut off from Christ in their stead, placed back under the wrath of God that he spoke about so eloquently back in chapter 1. The privileges that Israel enjoyed were so immense and numerous that their current rejection of the fulfilment of all their hopes and longings was doubly tragic and lamentable. The glory of the old covenant with its temple worship and future promises was theirs and they were humanly related to the patriarchs of old and to Jesus Christ himself. Yet they had not embraced the one to whom all things pointed when God in their flesh had appeared. No wonder Paul was so deeply troubled by this when in Romans 8 he had just praised the unbreakable love of God to sinners if Israel turned aside, had God's word failed? The answer must come back, by no means. But the agony of heart is real, even as we wrestle to the ultimate conclusion. Jesus too felt gut-wrenching compassion for Israel, even when they gathered together in a worldly fashion to compel him into political action. But he is greater than an earthly king and more glorious than any prophet. His free offer of satisfying food and bodies made whole is like manna in the desert under Moses or Elisha's multiplying of the loaves in a time of need. But will they respond with merely temporary gratitude for needs met or see in these things a sign of something greater, the fulfilment of all in the person of the self-sacrificing God-man. Our congregations, too, need to face this question. Are we here to satisfy our felt needs? 
or to meet the one who feels our need and took our place to give us eternal life.